the stream. This is my favorite part every time, this, this, this window through time. Here's our CRM. We have um, customers in it. We have ourselves with five different customers. Uh, we're going to implement something where for each customer there's going to be sort of a like or a friend button and then there's going to be sort of a sidebar that displays sort of our list of current uh, friends quote unquote and uh, the ability to remove friends from that list or also blank out the entire list so what I'm trying to model here in a bit of a different context is a shopping cart uh, sort of the uh, the concepts that would go into a shopping cart and the big concept that we'll be dealing with here is session. And so my PHP students already know what I'm talking about when I say session because they've already done work with session. Uh, for the app students, uh, session is something that web frameworks invented to get around the fact that the web is stateless. And so stateless by, uh, when I say that, what I mean is we're on this home page. I've connected to a server, I've loaded up a bunch of variables, I've queried my database, I've gathered my customers, I've generated HTML, I've pumped it out to the user's uh, browser, and then all that state disappears. And if I click on a link, go to like this missing email section, the entire system has to sort of build itself up from scratch again. All the state is built up, it delivers the page, all that state gets torn away. If I go back home, same thing happens. So there's no persistent state. None of our variables uh, remain after the page is being delivered. In many instances, this is a good thing on the web. The biggest sort of source of bugs in programming in general are state-based bugs, things that happen to your state that you don't want to happen. And uh, you know, debugging those can be fairly difficult because you don't know when your state sort of went wonky. With the web, at, after every request, everything gets cleared away. So there's no chance for sort of bad data to hang around. But it also means that you can't do sort of more interesting things. So for example, if you want a user to be able to log into a website, you would ask them for a username and password. Uh, if you had no state, after asking them for the username and password, your web application would promptly forget that you asked them for the username and password. And the next page they go to, you would have to ask them again, what's your username and password? So uh, most web languages or web frameworks have built uh, on top of what are called browser cookies, this ability to maintain state in something called session. So browser cookies are just uh, text files, basically, and they're just key value pairs that a web program sets on the server and sends them to the, to the end user. And as far as session goes, what happens is, is that an individual user gets identified with a key. And from that point on, their particular browser, when it sort of interacts with the server, it provides that key back to the server by way of the cookie. And uh, then the server can maintain state based on that particular key. And so what I'll do to begin with is I'll implement sort of the simplest thing you could possibly implement with session, which is just like a visit counter. So every time we come to this home page, we will display, you know, you have visited this page n times, where n is the actual number of times you visited the page. And that will demonstrate the fact that we're actually able to preserve some data across uh, different invocations of a website. So we can hit refresh a bunch of times, or we can leave the page and come back, and the count will, will be preserved. So let's open up a few files. I'll go to my app folder, into the views, and I will open up the index page and I'll also maybe I'll open up the missing email as well and then in the controllers I'll open up the customers controller so what I'd like is at the top of this index page for us to have a little paragraph that says something like you have visited this page n times and that n is eventually going to be uh, dynamic. There it is. You visited this page n times. Good. Okay, let's make it a little more dynamic. Let's um, inject in or echo in a uh, visit count variable that doesn't yet exist. 
and we'll make it exist in the controller. So here I am echoing in at visit count. So in my customer controller here, I will say visit count equals one. Again, it's still fairly static. Every time I come to this page, it'll say you've been here one times. So pluralization is off, right? It should say one time. And so Rails has a really awesome uh, helper. As web programmers, we deal with pluralization issues all the time. Uh, and so Rails gives us this really neat thing called pluralize. And so we say pluralize visit count. And then we specify the singular version of the thing we want to pluralize. Now, if, if visit count is one, it'll say time. If visit count is anything more than one, it'll say times. And if we wanted to, uh, if we had a word that Rails didn't know how to properly pluralize, we could explain to it how to properly pluralize it. So I could say, well, I want you to say times with a Z. And so now Rails will do that. And so when visit count is one, it'll say one time. And if I was now to go in to my controller and change this to say like 33, you visited this page one time. And so it pluralizes. This is a custom pluralization, but it knows how to pluralize most words, most standard words. So I can get rid of that and just leave the singular. And so that's a really nifty little helper. So 33 times. We want this page to actually keep count. We want to have it preserve uh, a visit for a particular user's browser. And so in my code here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start making use of a special hash that is just, it's sort of global to Rails applications. It, is similar to some of the other hashes that we have access to. So we have access to that flash hash, which pre preserves state for sort of one redirect. We have access to the params hash that gives us sort of user data from either get or post requests. And now we have access to something called session. And so I can ask myself, uh, there's sort of two cases. Either the user's coming for the very first time, in which case we'll have no uh, current count for their number of visits. Or they're visiting us again, and we already have a count, and we want to increment that count. So I'm going to say if session at position, uh, and I'll use a symbol here, visit count. I can use anything I want uh, symbol-wise for session. I could even key in on strings or whatnot. It's just sort of more the Rails way to use symbols. And there's nothing special about the naming of this. It's just I've picked a name for what uh, the position I want to use within session. And so I say if visit count is nil, meaning I've never seen this visitor before, well, then I'm going to set the visit count to one. They've been here once. Isn't there some fancy, like, there is. To set it? Like the, uh, like pipe. the double pipe equals. I'll show you that in a moment. But yes, there, there is. Uh, otherwise, I want to. Uh, increment visit count by one. And in all cases, I want to use this visit count to set my instance variable. Cool. Uh, seasoned Rails programmers would start to get mad at me. I'm, I'm making my controller actions fairly large at this point. Uh, the sort of early mantra of Rails was sort of uh, fat models, skinny controllers, right? Make your models, your business logic, uh, put it in the models, and, and everything else should be as, as sort of small as possible, especially your controllers. Uh, and we wouldn't need a model for this logic, but we might spin it off into a separate class, some kind of you know visit count class. Uh, but you'll have to, uh, just for the sake of simplicity, we'll just leave it in the controller action here. At this point, uh, we should be good to go. Uh, user visits, we're going to come and visit this page for the first time, and the visit count will be nil. So we'll set it to one. When I reload the page, we'll come back here, visit count will no longer be nil, so we will increase it by one. And in all cases, we're going to set that instance variable, and the instance variable is what's going to be output in our view, 
pluralized with the word time. So very first time we should see you have visited this page one time. Oops, reload. And if I reload the page, it goes to two. If I reload the page again, it goes to three. This is now because my the server has sent my browser a cookie uh, that uniquely identifies this particular instance of the browser and every time I talk back to the server or my browser talks back to the server it passes that cookie back and says this is who I am I am this particular ID and then in the back end Rails has a way of uh, basically there's a different version of this session hash for every user that has visited my page so it's not just a singular thing. There is a session hash that exists uh, sort of in the back end that's associated with every single user that's visited my website. So if I came to this website by way of another web browser, so I'll open up Firefox. And I will visit the page. And now it says one here. It says three here. If I reload Chrome, it says four. If I reload Firefox, it'll say two. So there's independent session happening. I could even, within Chrome, open up uh, Incognito Window, which has a completely separate cookie store. Uh, and it's great for testing sort of session and cookie based stuff. And it'll have its own count associated with it. So it'll start back at one, and then two, and then this one will still be at five. So for each one of these browsers, you could think of them being different users that are on completely different computers. Each one of them has the session has associated with it. So this is why we want to use something like session for a shopping cart, because we want the shopping carts to be attached to unique users. We don't want when I add something to my shopping cart that it's, we don't want it added to like everyone in the world's shopping cart. That would be awkward. Um, that might make for a really interesting e-commerce store where it's like some kind of social shopping where you know you all sort of collaboratively pick what you want to buy and you get some kind of great deal. I don't know. Um, yeah, so there you go. I'll close down Firefox now. This is, this is about as, as simple as it gets as far as uh, session goes. That's about all the code. Now, Brett, what you were thinking of uh, as far as the ability to uh, sort of do a nil test and set a default value. Rails has this fun thing uh, that sort of looks like this, or or equals. And so I could probably or equals it to one, and then I could sort of unconditionally do that. That's equivalent to what I had before. Or or equals is short form of saying the session count is equal to session uh, visit count or zero, you're likely more used to seeing an or used in the context of a Boolean expression. And here it sort of is, because if session count is nil, it evaluates as false. And so then you have to evaluate the second side of the or, right? So if something's false, the other side could be something which is true. And so uh, if, if session count is currently nil, the expression will evaluate to zero and visit count will be set. If session count contains something, it isn't nil, well then it evaluates to true and anything ORed with true is true. So we don't need to evaluate the second half of the expression. So the current state of visit count will be set for visit count. So that's, that's the sort of Rails way of giving something a default value. I only knew that the situation you use it, I didn't know why it worked. So there's, there's the why behind it. It's, so you're using uh, the Boolean OR operator in uh, an interesting way. And, and then still, unconditionally, we have to increment our visit count. I started at zero because you're visiting for the first time, and then right away, I increment you up to one. And so we should still be at the same, as we should go to six now. And et cetera. So what if we wanted to clear this back down to zero? We wanted to sort of have the, uh, the session forget what it knows. Uh, manually, we could clear out our cookies, right? The only thing that's identifying us as a particular uh, session user is the fact that we have a cookie stored for ourselves. 
or I could give the user some ability to to sort of reset himself, have the server sort of forget uh, forget that they visited a certain number of times. This is what happens when you log out of a website. So when you log in, uh, you give in your user ID and your or your username and your password. As long as you sort of get the correct thing, uh, session will be used to identify you as having logged in. And when you go to log out, that session just needs to be blown away. So let's do something along those lines. I'm going to go to my routing file. And I'm going to um, add a new route to customers. And it'll be a route which will be a get request, sort of poor form. Uh, in the world of the web, you're really not supposed to use GET requests that have any effect on the back end. A GET request should only ever fetch cacheable data. So I'm sort of breaking the, the HTTP rules here because I'm going to have a GET request have a side effect on the back end, and the side effect is going to be that our session gets cleared out. So I apologize for uh, throwing the conventions of HTTP to the wind in front of all of you impressionable minds. So. Uh, let's create a new uh, get request method called uh, uh, forget me bro and this will forget uh, the user by clearing out session and so this uh, again is a way of adding uh, custom routes to a collection of routes that was built up by way of this resource command and it's one that doesn't pertain to a particular instance of a customer, so it's just a plain old uh, collection get. So that'll give me a new route that will route to a yet to be created uh, method called forget me bro. And all forget me bro needs to do is nil out my session. and maybe redirect me back to the action called index. And so clicking on a link to forget me bro should clear out my session, redirect me back to the index, at which point uh, the visit count will be nil, so then it will be set to zero, then it'll be increased to one, and we'll be back at, back at one again. And I also now need a link to this. So, I'm just going to run another command prompt here and do my uh, rake routes because sometimes I forget how the naming goes when you don't use the match method and you don't specify your own naming. Uh, Rails is going to give a particular name to this route and I'll need to use that to build my link. So I'm going to have a link uh, here on this page which will just say link to uh, forget me. It's going to go to some path, which I will find out in a moment when I look at my rake routes output. Forget me, bro. Customers path. That was I found that right here. In a sense. Uh, all of this stuff that I'm implementing right now really has nothing to do with customers. And so I'm sort of hijacking the customer controller uh, for this purpose. It's probably not the best place for this code to go. Uh, but again, I'm trying to keep things simple here. So now I have the index handling counting. I have this forget me for bro handling uh, sort of blanking out the count. And I have a link here to that particular path. So this should do what we expect. I should be able to reload the page, which should say seven times now. And I get this link. And hopefully, if I've done everything correctly, when I click this link, uh, the number of times should go back to one. So here's the moment of truth. Yikes. Uh, redirect to is the actual method, right, Kyle? Yes. Redirect to. So let's try that again. Um, reload. Good. One time, 
two times, three times, clicking on forget, brings me back to one time. And hover, can you hover over the Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's slash customer slash forget me bro. So by you don't have to know that path because you know the name of the route and we know the name of the route because we did a rake routes to figure out what the, the name was. Any questions about that? Uh, the routing, there wasn't much going on in the routing. Uh, almost everything happened inside of these two actions here. So that's the absolute simplest sort of example I could think of to demonstrate what session gives us. Um, now I'm going to try to implement a bit of a shopping cart. I'm going to cheat a little bit because I've done this already. So I have a cheat sheet here that's going to help me um, uh, deal with implementing this. What I would like to do is I would like to have um, a button here that says like for all of my customers and if I click on it then I'm going to remember using session that I have liked that particular customer at which point I want that link to now say unlike so that I could potentially unlike that particular customer and so uh, we're going to need two new routes one route for sort of like adding a friend that's what liking is going to do in, in, in our case here. And one route for removing a friend. And those will be member routes because they have to do with a particular customer, a particular customer that has a particular ID. And so when I want to add to a resource uh, and get a route that includes an ID parameter, I say member do end which is sort of going to be the same as if I had done a match, a manual match command and I had uh, you know, put in something like add friend and put in an ID like that. But I'm going to do it sort of the, the Railsy RESTful routing way. So I want a member route that will be get request for um, adding a friend and a get request for uh, removing a friend. And again, these should, and maybe I'll do some refactoring later, these should probably be uh, not get requests because again, they have a side effect. They're, the, the action that they're carrying out is not cacheable. They're changing something in the back end. So they should uh, more likely be, uh, be a post. Okay, so those routes are added. If I was to run rake routes again, I would see them show up in my list of routes. Uh, to begin with, I'm going to uh, now have to work with my partial for my customer. Where did my app folder go? Okay, so there's my views, customers, there's my customer partial. I have this area up at the top where I have that edit link already. And so beside that, or in front of that, that's where I'm going to put my like button. And so here I'll, uh, I'll do just that. I'll say uh, link to like the path is going to be the add friend customer path. And I need to know which customer to add. So I have to pass the customer object just like I did for the edit one below there. We'll do the like first, and then we'll we'll work on the uh, the optional uh, sort of unlike. Okay, that's all well and good. Um, I need a associated action in here, so I need a add friend action and a uh, remove friend action. Each one of them will have access to the ID of the friend I wish to either add or remove in the params hash. <coughs> because if we look at the route that was generated for us, so the add and remove friend routes both have an ID in the route. So when we passed the 
customer to the path, that ID would be injected into the URL, and then we get access to the ID in the params hash. And so if I went and just uh, visited my homepage here, I should see all like buttons or like uh, links. And each one of them, if I hover over it, that one says customer slash one slash ad friend, customers two slash ad friend, customers three, et cetera. So it's using their primary keys. Uh, and if I was to click this link, right now nothing would happen, but uh, I need to make something happen. So what I would like to happen is initially I want my session to be an array. So session, and I'm just going to say uh, friends. That's where I'm going to store my list of friends. And I'll say or equals an empty array. So if it hasn't yet been assigned a value, it will get an empty array. Otherwise, it'll just remain whatever it was before. So if it's an array that contains some data already, this uh, line will have no effect. So this is just um, default to empty array. And then I'm going to shove into my array the ID of my friend. That's what I'm going to do. Like that. So every time I click the, the like link for any individual friend, I just push that ID into my array. And I don't need a view associated with this. I'll just redirect back to the action called index. Is there a way to do it without redirecting? Um, like yes. Yeah, you could definitely do it Ajaxy. Uh, working with Ajax and Rails uh, isn't too complicated. Uh, jQuery is built in, and there are uh, there is the ability to even have Rails sort of generate JavaScript to respond to particular actions. So it is it is definitely doable in in an Ajax way. I just won't uh, I just won't show it. Yeah. What I also should do at this point is um, up at the top of my index view, I just want to see that, uh, I just want to see what's in my session. So uh, above this visit link, I'm going to drop in a little debugging command. There's this lovely command in Rails called debug, and I can just say debug session. And it's going to just print out for me like a human readable version of what's in the session hash so I can see it change with time. That's going to be very helpful before I sort of finish implementing the rest of what I'm working on here. So initially, this is what session looks like. Uh, I've got my session ID. This is the actual <coughs> identifier that would be found in the cookie associated with this particular browser. So if I actually went and looked at the cookies associated with localhost, because cookies are always bound to a particular host. So if I looked at the cookies associated with localhost, I'd see a Rails cookie uh, that had this number in it. Uh, this token is uh, for forms. So when we submit Rails-based forms, they include a hidden uh, token that identifies them as being a valid form, and that's just to stop uh, sort of random scripts from messing with Rails forms, because if someone tries to submit to a uh, Rails page and that their submission doesn't include this token, it just gets rejected. But here's the actual sort of user-created or programmer-created session stuff. This is our visit count. So when I click like on any one of these uh, customers, I should now see a friends key appear in my session and it should be associated with an array and that array should initially have one element in it and if I click on this user that element should be the number one if I click on this user that element should be the number two so I'll click on the number two and there we are friends points to an array that has the number two in it good happy uh, click on number one, I should now have two elements in my array, a two and a one, a two, a one, and a three. Great. It'll still push it. So 
there it is two appears twice so there, there is some problems here right uh, which we can we, we can work with um, so let's let's fix that problem first how do we make it so that we don't add customers that are already in our oops I opened up like every possible side window at the same time okay so how do we sort of add every possible uh, user well we can we can do something like this like uh, unless session friends dot include question mark params a position ID and at this point get rid of this repetition here say ID equals params a position ID and then I'll just use the ID in both places So that, I think, will solve our problem. So add to the array of friends unless the array already includes that particular number. Uh, so let's, let's try it again. We'll go back to my code. Now, my array's already sort of messed up to begin with, but uh, I shouldn't get another one in there if I click this one. It should still be four elements, and it is. But I should be able to add this customer, which is customer five. And so, so it still works. So that, that, that problem is now solved. Uh, I'll need some way. Eventually, I'm going to get a, create a way to sort of clear out my list, because now it contains bad data. Uh, we're going to use that same include method now in the view, because we're going to check to see if the, uh, if the session friends contains a particular ID, we want to say unlike rather than like. So at this point, I could start uh, sort of messing around here, uh, but the logic is going to get a little bit more complicated than I'd like. To. This is already a fairly complicated view, so maybe it would be nice to have a little partial here just to sort of keep that complexity out of, uh, out of this view. So I might uh, create a partial called uh, underscore friending.html.erb and then I will move this into there and at this point here I will render out render friending Save, save. Just let me test to make sure that is not going to break anything. Yikes. Uh, I'll need to pass the, the customer variable over. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying uh, I want access to this customer variable and I want it still to be called customer in my other uh, partial and so I want to make some local variables accessible. This should be a hash, sorry. So locals is a hash of key value pairs. The keys appear, end up as variables that are accessible inside of my, uh, my partial and then the values are whatever value. So it's sort of like a way of passing parameters into a partial. So you can sort of start to think of partials as if they are almost like HTML generating methods, and we use the locals hash to get uh, parameters into there. So now let's check to see if it, uh, if it worked. Like customer locals. It's going to make me do this all uh, manually like this. Render partial friending locals customer. Better. OK, so the short form of render, uh, just like a lot of things with Rails, it tries to do a lot of things sort of automatically for you. And then when you want to do things like pass locals in or sort of add extra parameters to render, this is sort of the more full form way of rendering a partial. 
So I'm saying render, what do I want to render? A partial, what is that partial called? Friending, and then the, method, the, the variables I wish to pass to it. So now I have a partial, and inside of this partial, I can do something like this. I can say, you know, if my params, and I have access to my params hash inside of my views, uh, which I don't know how I feel about that. That's a bit, a bit too global for my liking, but it's okay, I guess, for, for, for this. Maybe it would be better to have put the params friends into uh, an instance variable or pass it in, but we'll, we'll, we'll be okay with it for now. You guys are fine with me using a global variable, right? Yeah. I get paranoid about passing on bad habits to my students is what, what I get paranoid about. So uh, I try to give at least some warning when I'm doing something that I don't feel too comfortable with. Uh, so if friends params, uh, if it includes the uh, customer's ID, and that's my customer object that I passed into this particular um, partial, then I want to unlike that. And so this is going to be the else. Path. This will be the associated end. Here, I'll copy and paste that there. And I'll say unlike, and I called it remove friend. That should do me. For any uh, customer ID that's already in my list, I will now put out a remove link. Otherwise, the like link will appear. If I go back to my code, I think I've added almost all. Oh, what did I do wrong? Session at position friends. Oh, session. Sorry, I put params. It's not in session. I mean, not in params, it's in the session. So session at position friends dot include my customer ID. Let's try that again. They all aren't in there. But you are in there. OK, so some debugging needs to occur now. Let's see if I really have access to this variable here. I can sort of do a debug on session at position friends. And that'll now appear inside of each one of my uh, partials. OK, they're in there. You know what it's doing? It's submitting the elements as strings. Oh, yeah, it is. And so they're not actually in there. Um, so here, let's, let's, let's fix that up. Add it in terms of an integer. Params tends to get things as strings because the web sort of works on strings. Uh, URLs are built out of strings. Forms submit strings. So the things that end up on a param hash almost always end up in there as strings, even though they're numbers. So here I'm, you know, sort of forcing uh, this thing to be an ID, and then when we go to check with the actual IDs, uh, it should uh, be okay. This was working previously because these two things were both strings. And so here I'll just put a little hack in here uh, I'll, to the forget me bro. I'll also add the fact that we'll clear out uh, the friends just so I can wipe that session. So let's do that. Nil class nil. Okay, that's problematic. This will solve later on. I'm okay with uh, with this being solved in a moment. Why do you think that happened? Why do you think I'm getting like a nil class nil on include? Question mark. Because it doesn't have that method. Yes, because I just cleared it out, right? I just basically set it to nil here. Now I'm going to do this. I'm going to cheat a little bit. Uh oh. You're not going to let me cheat, are you? I'm 
going to cheat anyways. There. So I, I cheated. I cheated by setting it equal to an empty array. Otherwise, what I had done is I would set it to nil, and then here, on nil, I called include. Nil, nil errors are like every Ruby programmer's enemy, right? So eventually, uh, you get really tired of seeing nil class nil errors. They happen all the time. OK, um, this should work now. Like, unlike, like, unlike. And you can see now my uh, friends is an array of integers rather than strings. I'll get rid of this debugging information that I put into there. Now I need to actually implement that unlike uh, functionality to have it actually do something. And, oh, neat. I, can, I haven't used this method in a while. Uh, remove friend. Here I will also grab the ID and turn it into an integer. And then I will go to my session at position friends and delete the ID from that list. I think I could just delete the, the ID from the list. I was going to do a check, say, like, you know, unless it's not in there. Uh, but it has to be in there. It has to be in there for me to see that link. Yeah. It's maybe, I mean, for safety's sake, I might want to still do the check, but because I could manually type out a link. So now I have these two. So like should still work. And I should be able to unlike. OK, that's OK. So this is a template missing, uh, meaning that I got to the end of an action where it was expecting a view to exist, uh, but there is no view for remove friend. And that's just because I have to do the same kind of redirect after it to send me back to the index. Because I don't want views associated with these things. I just want them to do what they need to do and then redirect me, redirect me back to the index. So I, here I, I did this. OK, so unlike this friend here. Good. Unlike this friend here. Good. Friending works to this point. Uh, to make this a, a bit more akin to a shopping cart, it might be nice to uh, sort of have a side menu, which so displays like my list of friends. Before I do that, does anyone have any questions about what I've done so far? We can go back and look at the, this is where most of the magic happened, adding and removing friends. In the, where you got the ID? That was because when I made my route, I made it as a member route. And that's the equivalent of doing something like putting an ID in there. Oh, okay. And so the URL for add friend and for remove friend, if we look at my routes, includes ID placeholders. And when I actually went to build those or display those links here, I passed to the paths the object I was working on. So it would take the ID of each of these customers and inject them into the URL. And then once it's in the URL from the controller, I can access it by way of the params hash. And then I convert it into an integer. Any other questions or comments at this point? OK, let's, um, let's build another partial. And I'll call this like myfriends.html.erb. And Initially, I'll just have this display on the index page, 
but eventually it might be nice for it to be a bit more like a shopping cart and have it present on like other pages, right? So that when I go to the, like the missing email page that also uh, has access to uh, the shopping cart or the, the friend list as well. But initially I'll just sort of have it be displayed inside of here. Then I will go and I'll actually put it in the layout file so that any page I add, it'll always be present. So initially I'll just render it here though for just testing purposes. So I'll just say uh, render the, what's the best way to do this? I'm just actually seeing sessions so I'll have access to it. Okay, so render the uh, my friends partial. I don't think I need to do it in a more formal manner. So I'm rendering my friends here. I'm still displaying my debugging uh, session information in the my friends partial. Just for testing purposes, I'll drop in uh, like maybe an H3, which says my friends. Okay, nice. If session apposition friends is empty, you have no friends. Sad face. So right now, I, I, I think I have friends. No, I don't. So I should, I should see that. Maybe. And the reason I say maybe is, well, we'll see. Good, I do. The reason I have that is because this is this is sort of uh, been initially seeded as an array. But what if my user was coming here for the very, very first time? Dot empty would be called on a nil. Dot empty would be called on a nil. So again, we'd have a nil class error. Let's see that happen, right? Just so you don't think I'm crazy. Blank. Undefined method empty for nil, nil class, oh, right? So what we would like is there, there should be some way of uh, ensuring that I always have access to at least an empty array there. And in doing so, I'll end up clearing out or cleaning up some of my code a little bit to like, I won't need this to, to be in there to default. Um, either and this can just nail things out. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to do something that we haven't yet seen in this course, which I'm, I'm going to create a protected method on my controller. Now up to this point, every method we add to a controller becomes an action. It becomes something we can route to. But protected methods are, they're protected, right? The, the, their visibility is scoped solely to the class itself. They're not available to the outside world. Uh, so, I mean, they're just a little bit more visible than a private method. Um, and so these can be things that I can call internally just to my class. And so here I might say, called something like um, initialize friends. And here I might have something along the lines of like this. So that no matter what, once I've called this method, if there's nothing set for friends, we'll give it an empty array. How do I get this to trigger? Well, I'm going to get it to trigger, and I'll fix this up here. I'll add this to nil now. Using a before filter. So up here at the top of the controller, I can say before filter, initialize friends. And what that means is before every action is run, it's going to look for a protected method called initialize friends and run it. Before filters are super, super handy. Way back when we were doing the blog, I talked about the fact that my controller wasn't so dry. We can take a quick peek back in time here. So if we look here 
and we look to the blog. Which blog am I? I have so many projects in here at this point. Um, Oh, like REST. REST. Yeah, that's the other big acronym. I think it was in here that I had something that wasn't so dry. Well, even this, like this and this, they're, they're sort of doing the same thing. But you only need those both for the show and the edit. I could potentially do something like this uh, before filter load post. Uh, by ID, but only for the actions show and edit. And then I could, you know, show and edit could then become empty. And down here, I could have a protected method called uh, load post by ID, which did that. And so now this method will be run before the show and the edits loading up the post. So I've removed some repetition. There's a big, there at least was for a while, a big controversy in the Rails community as to whether or not this was good form. Because now you have these actions that are empty and someone looking at your code will just assume that they're empty and they might skip over the fact that you've got a before filter loading up posts for them. But it is a way to dry up your code. If you do see repetition, things that you're doing consistently across a lot of actions, uh, an option is to use a before filter and lock it down into a protected method down below. And in this case, I only wanted that to happen uh, in two places, maybe three. Is there one other place? Yeah, update. So I could also, oh, and destroy. So I could have it happen in all those cases. all the member links, all the links that load up a post by ID. So that was just a, an aside. Here I'm doing it and I want it to happen always. No matter where I am on my site, I want to initialize my friends. And so now if I uh, open up another incognito window, so I'm visiting the website for the first time, it shouldn't error. And in case it doesn't, it, it just says you have no friends and you can see that my friends have been defaulted to an empty array. I can now like friends. That message goes away, and now I have to implement it so that I actually display something uh, on that page. Now, in my session hash, I just have IDs. Here, I would like to display more than IDs, right? I don't want to just say your friends are friend number one and friend number three. Uh, I'd like to actually say the names of these friends. And I again want this to be present in all pages. So maybe that's another thing I could add to my initializer here. Maybe I also have a like a variable called my friends. I'll just call it friends just so it matches this key here. Um, friends and every time we load up I'll start it as a empty array and then I will do session friends dot each and for each ID I want to go to my friends array and push in the customer with that ID Does that make sense? So for every ID that's in this array, I'm going to pull out each ID, go to my customer model, and actually figure out which customer that is, who is my actual friend, and put it into this array of friends. So now I'll have an array of customer objects, each one representing one of my friends. Yeah, clear? Okay. I'll show you sort of what I mean by that. In the my friends partial here, I now have an else on this clause. 
And just to begin with, I'll just debug that friends variable that I made. I now have one friend. It was this one that I clicked like on. And here is that entire customer object. Oh, it looks like I have two friends. Oh, I do have two friends. So if I click unlike on this one, I should now have one friend in my system. And there is the debug of that one friend. And you can see it's the whole, uh, all the row data from that particular customer. And then again, if I click like on another friend, I'll have multiple friends being displayed here. So that's not really what I want to happen here. All I want to happen here maybe is uh, like a loop through those friends. Um, do friend. And then for each one of these friends, I'm going to uh, display their name. So here I can display their name. <laughs> and I could probably use this partial now, can't I? Because it'll create a like or unlike button for me. Um, so I can go echo out the friend.name. I think it was name or is it full name? Full name. And then I can render my partial, same as what I did here, my friending partial. And this time, the local variable I'm passing in is not customer, it's my friend. Because that's what I'm looping through here. So that's the sort of handy part about using partials where you have locals. Now I'm passing in a completely different named object, but it's going to end up as something called customer inside of the partial itself. So that's sort of my parameterized locals for that partial. So hopefully that works. Let's go see, um, see it in action. May have to debug it a little bit. We'll see. There's my two friends. Can add a third one. Add a fourth one. Unlike one of them. Oh, two of my friends have the same name. That's OK. And I can unlike them. It might be nicer to display them in a unordered list. So something like UL. And these would be inside of LIs. There you go. Uh, let's now get rid of this debugging information and put this into a sidebar in my application layout so that it can be present on all of my pages so that when I go to the missing email page, I can also uh, see my friends there and, you know, like or unlike those friends like that. So let's, let's do that. Right now I've got the debugging information coming out here. I can get rid of that. I've got this rendering of my friends happening here. I'm going to cut that out of there as well. And I'm going to put it into my application layout. Let's do this. Sidebar. I'll style it up in a moment, but let's just see if it's going to be present now on every page. So it should be present on missing email. Ooh, 
CRM app views layouts. Render my friends. Oh, do I have to say customers? Interesting. Well, let's debug this. It'll sh hopefully sh tell me what I'm doing wrong in here. So here I am loading up the main page, finding a bunch of related data. It is trying to load up my friends.html.erb. Oh, did I forget my equal sign? No. Oh, is it displaying down below? <laughs> it was there all along. Uh, yeah, awesome. Uh, let's put it up at the top, or let's actually style it so it'll go to the side. Might as well apply a bit of styling here. I can get my watt out of there. Uh, okay. Um, my styling happens in my app assets style sheets folder. Uh, and I'm in here. I currently have like a content that has a fixed width. Um, and I have a section and an aside within that. Here and here. And so my section and my aside I want to float left and my section I want to give a specific width to in pixels and my side I also want to give a specific width to in pixels and they're going to be some percentage of those oh, I could maybe do percentage right um, like 80 percent and 20 percent Loading beside each other with fixed widths. Okay. And there it is. Um, a little ugly, right? It's not the most beautiful formatting. Maybe I could do a little bit of messing around so I could at least bring this, my friends, into alignment with the top of this line here. That might make it look slightly nicer. Not trying to win any huge design contests at this point, though. Uh, and you can see, because of the way I built my sort of grid-based layout, the the grid of customers is fine. It just sort of now it's a sort of a three-up grid rather than a four-up grid. Uh, and so my aside, I might want to add like a uh, top margin to push it down a little bit. Oh, I was almost right on. Ninety-seven margin top, ninety-seven pixels. Okay, uh, yeah, not beautiful. I don't really like the fact that these LIs are pumping out like that. Um, so that's in my aside. So maybe my UL needs to have its margin left set to zero, or is it the LIs inside that have to have their margin left? Fine. You want to fight? Fight. There. Don't challenge me, CSS. I'll bring out the negative margins on you. <laughs> there we are. All right. Um, yeah, there's sort of like how we would build a shopping cart, right? So like we've got friends here. I can I can like them as I like them. They get uh, they get added to my list. It's bothering me that two of my friends have the same name, so I can go make a modification there.
So this should still work. This should now take me to active admin. I'll probably have to log in at this point to make this change. Oh, neat. And that's built into the Chrome? Yeah, it's just a little That's cool. How do I make it come up? Go to here, inspector. OK, one second. And then there's a gears at the bottom of your right. Oh, this one here? Yeah. And then scroll down. I had no idea there were settings here. Show rulers uh, on the left. Show rulers. Neat. And now what does it do? If you inspect something. Oh, look at that. Really neat. OK. And then I, oh, wow. This is like a whole new world for me. <laughs> <laughs> and now you've just made my uh, sort of lining up <laughs> obsession like even worse. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Yeah. For someone like me that really likes to line things up, this is this is really, really nice. Probably I'll just waste more cycles on uh, lining these up now, but <laughs> that's OK. Now it's bothering me that those aren't lined up. <laughs> Thanks, Brent. OK. That's probably better. OK. Um, yeah, uh, right now I've overloaded this thing to, to sort of remove my friends, but let's fix that. So let's get rid of the, the forget me is not going to be tied to my friend list anymore. I'm going to have like a clear friends or equivalent if you're building a shopping cart would be your, your clear cart at that point. So I'll go back, I'll close up a bunch of the stuff that I have open here because it's not uh, relevant anymore. The routing isn't relevant either. Okay, so in my controller here, I'm going to remove that and I might want to have a clear friends, which just uh, session at position friends goes to nil, and it redirects. So I just blank out the friends. I'll need a route for that. I just closed my routing file, so I will need to open that up again. And here I'll say get clear friends and now in my friends partial I can path to that so here I could say link to clear friends uh, customers clear friends path oh and I built the path wrong because it's not a member anymore, right? Now I'm talking about a collection of things. Uh, when I want to clear friends, I don't want to have a URL that has an ID in it because I don't want to clear out just one friend. I should make this a collection because that doesn't that has to do with my collection of friends. It doesn't need a particular ID. Let's see if that works. My path name will be wrong. I haven't sort of internalized how these get created yet, so I'm going to have to run rake routes again. Have you guys noticed that? Basically, like the more you work with Rails, you start to internalize the conventions, and as you do, it gets easier. But before you do, it's just like this big battle because everything's a convention. Uh, have you noticed that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it, it does get better the more you work with it, but then I find like I spend a little time away from Rails, and then I've sort of I've lost all those conventions, and then I have to sort of load them back up into my brain. Again, which is why I'm sort of um, I'm happy that things like the the Rails guides exist. So my clear oh clear friends customers okay so customers comes last on those generated routes. Clear friends customers path. And so clicking on that should allow me to clear out this list. All of my friends should be set to like rather than unlike, and this should tell me that I have no friends. Right on, passive aggressive web design. Um, and I think that's as far as I want to go. I'm still a little troubled by the fact that um, 
I'm altering backend state uh, based on get requests. That's sort of bothering me at this point, uh, but I won't, I won't refactor it just now because I think this screencast is probably long enough. So I'm going to stop the screencast.